is a, where they are pioneers in interfaith dialogue, particularly an interfaith dialogue, uh, a Christian Vaishnava uh, dialogue and a Vaishnava Muslim dialogue annually. She's a mother. She's a grandmother of the illustrious devotee family. And the Kirtan artist that we all know and love, Garvani, is her beloved son. So together they lead a Bhakti Immersion Kirtan Adventure to India each year, which I hope that many of us will be part of one day. Uh, she shares teachings uh, to inspire and spread those seeds of Bhakti through various social media platforms, which we will be sure to share with you in the chat today in case anyone is interested to follow her. And finally, I will personally say that I will forever be grateful for the guidance and compassion she has provided myself and my husband, Robert, over the years as we grow in our own personal uh, Krishna conscious journey. So to that ado, I will turn the mic over to you, Rukmini Devi, for a special class for this iFest uh, Saturday morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, my dear friend, Anita. Yeah, I'm so grateful to Anita and Robert. I couldn't do any of the things I do without their help, advice, and assistance. So thank you so much, Anita, for your overly kind words. And I just feel um, so grateful to the IFAS community to be invited today. You know, I was thinking that um, there was someone once who used to derisive, derisively uh, refer to Bhakti Tirtha Swami as the love guru. And um, I was thinking that, wow, that was so correct. And his, his disciples and his followers are carrying that mood of love, authentic love out into the future. And I, I was thinking that, um, yeah, this is what we need today. Um, love, sweet love, right? This is what the world needs now. Love, sweet love. So these are my dear, dear friends in the world, the, um, the wonderful devotees of the I IFAS community. So thank you so much for inviting me. Gopishwari told me I could sing Jai Radha Madhava for a little while before we start. So I'm going to try that with my little mini tambura here. Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jaya Radhaman Baba Kunja Bihari Ya Shodanandana Rajajana Ranjana Ya Shodanandana Rajajana Ranjana Gopi Chana Vallava Vidivarana Gopi Chana Vallava Vidivarana Yasara Nandana Vraja Jana Ranjana Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. Jaya Radha Gopi Nath Radha 
All glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to the assembled devotees. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Mad eka bandhu mat sangim mad guru mad mahadana. Man nistaraka man bhagya madhananda namostite. This is a verse from Sanatan Goswami. O Srimad Bhagavatam, O my only friend, O my companion, O my teacher, O my great wealth, O my deliverer, O my good fortune, O my bliss, I offer my most respectful obeisances unto you. This is from the Krishna Lila Stava of Srila Sanatan Goswami. So now we can look at the verse we are reading today from Srimad Bhagavatam, fourth canto, seventh chapter, verses number 16 and 17. I won't do this responsively. I'll just chant the verses and then um, read the per verse and per verses and purports. Brahmana. No, it starts here. Maitreya Uvacha Shamapyaivam Samidvasam Brahmana Chanumantritaha Karma Santanayam Asa Sopadyar Svid Adibihi. Translation. I'll, I'll read the word for word first. Maitreya, the sage Maitreya. Uvacha said, Shama, forgiveness, Apya, receiving, Evam, thus, Sa, King Daksha, Midvam, Sam, unto Lord Shiva, Brahmana, along with Lord Brahma, Cha, also, Anumantritaha, being permitted, Karma, the sacrifice, Sana, Sanayayam, Asa, began again, Sa, along with, Upadhyaya, learned sages, Ritvik, the priests, Adi B, and others. Translation. The great sage Maitreya said, 
Thus, being pardoned by Lord Shiva, King Daksha, with the permission of Lord Brahma, again began the performance of the yajna along with the great learned sages, the priests, and others. Now, text number 17. Vaishnavam yajna santatyai jikapalam dijotamaha purudasam niravapam virasam stargasudhaye Word for word, Vaishnavam meant for Lord Vishnu and or his devotees, yagya, sacrifice, santatyai for performances, tri kapalam, three kinds of offerings, dvija uttama, the best of the brahmanas, puro dasam, the oblation called puro dasa, niravapam, offered, vira, virabhadra, and other followers of Lord Shiva. Samsarga, contamination, dosa, due to touching, due to his touching, sudhaye, for purification. Translation, thereafter, in order to resume the activities of sacrifice, the brahmanas first arranged to purify the sacrificial arena of the contamination caused by the touch of Virabhadra and the other ghostly followers of Lord Shiva. Then they arranged to offer into the fire the oblations known as Puro Dasa, purport by his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada. Lord Shiva's followers and devotees headed by Virabhadra are known as Viras, and they are ghostly demons. Not only did they pollute the entire sacrificial arena by their very presence, but they disturb the whole situation by passing stool and urine. Therefore, the infection they had created was to be first purified by the method of offering puro dasa oblations. A Vishnu yagya or an offering to Lord Vishnu cannot be performed uncleanly. To offer anything in an unclean state is called seva aparad. The worship of the Vishnu deity in the temple is also Vishnu Yajna. In all Vishnu temples, therefore, the priest who takes care of the Archana Vidhi must be very clean. Everything should be always kept neat and clean, and the foodstuffs should be prepared in a neat and clean manner. All these regulative principles are described in the nectar of devotion. There are 32 kinds of offenses in discharging Archana service. It is required, therefore, that one be extremely careful not to be unclean. Generally, whenever any ritualistic ceremony is begun, the holy name of Lord Vishnu is first chanted in order to purify the situation. Whether one is in a pure or impure condition, internally or externally, if one chants or even remembers the holy name of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vishnu, one immediately becomes purified. The yajna area, arena, was desecrated by the presence of Lord Shiva's followers headed by Virabhadra, and therefore the entire arena had to be sanctified. Although Lord Shiva was present and he is all auspicious, it was still necessary to sanctify the place because his followers had broken into the arena and committed so many obnoxious acts that sanctification was possible only by chanting the holy name of Vishnu, Chikapala, which can sanctify the three worlds. In other words, it is admitted herein that the followers of Lord Shiva are generally unclean. They are not even very hygienic. They do not take baths regularly. They wear long hair and they smoke ganja. Persons of such irregular habits are counted amongst the ghosts. Since they were present in the sacrificial arena, the atmosphere became polluted and it had to be sanctified by Trikapala oblations, which indicated the invocation of Vishnu's favor. Om Agyana Timarandasya 
Yamanjana Salakaya Jatsun Yagami Nakasman Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhistam Stapitam Bhuna Bhutale Svayam Rupakada Mayam Dadati Sapadam Dikam Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasate Deve Gorabhani Pacharine Nirvishesha Sanyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Mukam Karoti Vacha Lam Tango Langayate Dirin Yatripas Tamaham Vande Shri Gurun Dumatarinam Vanchaka Pataru Vyascha Kripa Shindu Vaiva Chapatitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gora Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare So here we are in this Daksha Yagya, which was initially polluted by the uh, intentions of, of Daksha himself. He, um, his intentions were based on his own pride and his envy of Lord Shiva. And everything just started to go downhill from there. Offenses and counter offenses and and the most sad part is when Daksha's own daughter, Sati, self-immolates herself. So we can see that the result of passion and the result of ignorance is distress, right? When we begin any endeavor, we have to begin it with the right intentions. We have to begin any endeavor with humility, praying for blessings. Um, once Prabhupada said, before beginning anything, we should chant this prayer, Om Jnana Timarandasya, Gyananjana Salakaya, Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. You're going to start to cook, you're going to do something, you're, whatever you're doing, chant and pray for blessings first. Because who am I, right? I'm standing in the darkness of ignorance, and I need your help, my Lord, my dear spiritual master. And that's how we should begin every endeavor, because left to my own devices, right, I, I'm going to make so many mistakes, blunders, offenses, catastrophes, like we see here in these pages of Srimad Bhagavatam. So this verse and purport are mostly discussing purity and impurity and sanctification um, in regard to worship and sacrifices. Whenever Srila Prabhupada would begin a sacrifice for a fire sacrifice for initiation. Sarva vastang kato piva yasmare pundari kaksham savaya bhyantaraha suchi. Shri Vishnu, Shri Vishnu, Shri Vishnu. This uh, mantra says, whether one is pure or impure, or even having passed through all situations, simply by remembering the Pundari Kaksham, the lotus eyed supreme uh, personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu, one becomes purified within and without. So, um, there's a story when Srila Prabhupada arranged for the elaborate installation of the deities in Vrindavan when they finally finished the Krishna Balaram temple. And they were, uh, Prabhupada was arranging for this very elaborate installation ceremony with so many of the local Brahmin pundits from the Vrindavan area. Srila Prabhupada was explaining privately in his room to his disciples that the real installation takes place takes place um, by the chanting of, of Krishna's holy name. And that all these elaborate rituals are done really just to satisfy these local pandas. 
because actually it's Krishna's holy name that um, installs the deities and purifies everything. There's another story, uh, the uh, story of when Srila Prabhupada himself was taking sannyas at the temple of his sannyas guru, Bhakti Pragyan Keshava Maharaj in Mathura. So there were devotee priests who were chanting the different appropriate yajnic prayers and mantras. And Srila Prabhupada's very beloved god brother, a very, very pure devotee, maybe you've heard the name, very simple and pure uh, Babaji. His name was Akinshana Krishna Das Babaji, another disciple of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. He was leading the Harinam Kirtan in the background. And what was happening were, was that some devotees were trying to hear more clearly the mantras that were um, being chanted for the yagya. And, and they kept telling him, they kept gesturing to him, keep it down, keep it down. You're too loud chanting this Harinam. And, um, and he, he told the story later that our Srila Prabhupada, his god brother, kept when they would do that, Prabhupada kept turning around and telling him, no, more loud, chant more loudly. <laughs> so every time he would do that, yeah, Prabhupada would tell him, sing more loudly. So then later, at the time of Srila Prabhupada's disappearance, right after Srila Prabhupada left this world, Krishna Das Babaji, Kinchina Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj was there. And he pulled Bibi Govinda Maharaj aside, who's another person who really loves the holy name. He pulled him aside and he said, he told him this story that I just told. And he said that at that time, he knew that our Srila Prabhupada, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, would be the one to spread Krishna consciousness all over the world because of his um, unbreakable faith, his supreme faith in the holy name of Krishna. So that's a really important story, a really beautiful story and uh, a, a great lesson for us also. So the main thing, um, that's the main thing, right? And this dak, dak, Daksha Yagya, Lord Shiva was offended. So that created havoc for everyone present but the followers of Lord Shiva went a bit overboard, right? So Lord Shiva is a very mysterious character. He's very merciful and he ups, uplifts people out of the modes of passion and ignorance. And in many places, it's written that he's actually the greatest devotee of Lord Krishna, Lord Vishnu. We use that interchangeably. I'll explain that in a minute. So it's, in many places, it's explained that he's the greatest devotee. Some places, it's said that Radharani is the greatest devotee of, of Krishna. Some places, it says that Giriraj Govardhan, the mountain of Govardhan, is the greatest devotee of Krishna. But so generally, back to Lord Shiva here, generally, his followers try to imitate him in inappropriate ways. Can they drink an ocean of poison uh, the way Lord Shiva did during the time of the churning of the ocean of milk? I don't think so. So, as it said in this purport, uh, they're not generally not so clean. They're in the modes of passion and ignorance. And they have some spiritual knowledge. But as you can see, it's kind of a mix, right? And I was reminded of, like in the West, we have um, the Rastafarians and Bob Marley. And his music is so deeply spiritual. And um, my friend at the Temple Rose, she told me, that he, uh, the Rastafarians are followers of Lord Shiva. And that, I, I, I hope that's true, but that's what she told me. So um, it's a mix, right? They smoke ganja, they smoke weed and whatever else they do. Um, but Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his Sikh Shastakam prayers um, told us that it's the holy name that cleanses the dust from the mirror of our hearts, right? So what does that mean? It means that we'll be able to see ourselves and we'll be able to see Krishna and see the world in truth um, when we, in that mirror, depending on how much we polish it, right? We'll get clarity and we'll get vision by trying to come to the mode of goodness by this heart polishing. But if we get irritated by every rub on that mirror of our heart, right? You know, how dare you this? How dare you that? If we get irritated by every little rub, then how will our heart's mirror ever be polished? 
So in the worship of Krishna, or what Srila Prabhupada in this purport calls Vishnu Yagya, we have to aim to come to the mode of goodness. And Lord Krishna is the source of Lord Vishnu. Some people say that the very most important verse in the whole entire Srimad Bhagavatam is the pivotal verse that explains that. So let me just chant that verse. Um, the verse says that all the avatars, um, that of all the avatars, their original source is Lord Sri Krishna. So here's the verse. If you want to look it up, it's first canto, third chapter, 28th verse. Here's the verse. Ete cham sakala punsam krishnas tu bhagavan svayam indrari vyakulam lokam medayanti yuge yuge. All the incarnations are either plenary portions or portions of the plenary portions of the Lord. But Lord Sri Krishna is the original supreme personality of Godhead himself. And, when, and the, then the verse continues on to say, whenever there's a disturbance created in the world by the atheists, the Lord incarnates to protect the theists, right? So right now we know he's incarnated as his holy name. Just imagine the purification with, with Harinam parties all over the world in the cities all over the world, right? So Krishna conscious uh, worship is worship with the intention to please Krishna. And in order to approach the supreme pure, right? We have to become pure ourselves. Just like if you try to approach fire, you're gonna become hot and hotter and hotter and more fiery. Um, or if you try to approach water, what? You become wet, right? So Krishna consciousness is described as kind of like putting a cold iron rod, which would be ourselves, right? Into a fire. And when you keep that cold iron rod in that fire long enough, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And finally, if you pull it out, it becomes fire like fire itself, right? And it, it, it can act like fire. Whatever you touch that rod to will ignite. So I was thinking that even though we may be cold and and hard like that iron rod, if we stay in sangha, if we stay in association uh, with the transformative mode of goodness, we can also act like that fire and ignite in Krishna consciousness and burn away all the contamination in our hearts um, and in the hearts of others in the world. We can be so empowered if we stay in that sangha, right? But if we keep going in and out, if we keep pulling the, that rod of our hearts out, put it in, take it out, put it in, take it out. Um, like if we associate with saintly people, but then we go out and smoke, do whatever, then we can tend to get hot, but then we get cold again and then heat up and then get cold again. So how we choose to spend our time, who we choose to hang out with, this is up to us, right? Do we want to ignite in a sangha of spiritual awakening? Or do we want to stay cold and isolated? So try to find some association that can ignite your personal inspirations. And we're all different kinds of people. We're inspired by different things, but try to find what sets your spiritual heart on fire. That's a very personal thing, right? So in this purport, as it continues, there's a big discussion of purity in the temple or deity worship, right? Everything has to be kept neat and clean and the offering should be prepared in a neat and clean manner. In deity worship, Srila Prabhupada stressed cleanliness and punctuality. Take a shower after, uh, to say it politely, as they say, bef um, after answering nature's call, right? Or before you go to serve the deities, to take care of the deities. Your clothes have to be clean, your fingernails have to be cut short. Of course, there's an internal cleanliness by chanting the holy name and remembering Krishna. And there are so many practices in that chapter of nectar of devotion, um, so many practices that explain external cleanliness. So I wanna share a story with you. Um, at one time, I, um, I, I had the chance to go to, to Los Angeles to learn deity worship from Shilavati, who was, 
had been personally trained by Srila Prabhupada. So I, I got a chance to go there. I was from the Boston temple, but I, I begged if I could go there and learn deity worship. So I went there and I studied the deity worship. It's a very long story that I can share other parts of it at another time. But um, yeah, so I went there. I was there for a year actually. And I learned so much. It was a real blessing to be able to be there. And when I came back to Boston, I was very inspired to, to share and to teach the things I, I had learned. Um, but the devotees there, maybe it was the way I presented it, that's possible. But the devotees there were not very interested in hearing um, and learning what I'd learned. And, and they were saying, well, in Los Angeles, they do it that way. This is the way we do it in Boston. This is the way we do it in New York. And, you know, so um, I was getting quite frustrated. And I, I read that Srila Prabhupada said that without bhava or ecstatic love, deity worship is only idol worship. So, wow, I was really troubled by the situation. I was really troubled by that statement of Srila Prabhupada. So then I had a dream. I had this dream that, that the deities were on the altar and, and the curtains closed and then the curtains opened again and the deities were gone. When the curtains opened, the deities were gone. So I was really, really upset. And uh, I thought, oh, this is, you know, this is my negligence and everything's going wrong. And if I had Baba, then I wouldn't be just doing idol worship and the situation here is completely untenable. And so at that time we were starting to be told not, don't, don't bother Srila Prabhupada, don't write him any letters, but I did write him a letter. I wrote him a letter and I, I told him about this dream I'd had and I told him, I think it's just because of my, my offenses and my, you know, because I don't have any ecstatic love that the deities have disappeared and how am I ever gonna get bhava or ecstatic love, I don't know. So this is the letter I wrote to Prabhupada. So um, Srila Prabhupada wrote me a letter back, which you can find in the letters book. But if you don't know the backstory, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of um, funny. The whole letter Prabhupada's just telling me all these different things, different ways to practice cleanliness. Shower, cut your fingernails, short, do this, do that, all these things. And then at the end, he says, um, it's very quite, quite humorous mood. At the end, he says, and then the bhava will come. So <laughs> it was really a very charming exchange that um, you can't really understand without having, hearing the backstory. So yeah, so this seva aparad, our offenses in deity worship, they're listed in Nectar of Devotion. There are so many of them in chapter eight of Nectar of Devotion. So these seva aparads or offenses in deity worship can be absolved or forgiven if one takes shelter of the holy name of Krishna. So we shouldn't think, oh, I can do anything. I can do any nonsense I want and then chant Hare Krishna and be forgiven, no. That is one of the most serious, serious offenses to the holy name. It's compared to the bath of an elephant. The elephant takes a nice bath with his trunk, right? But then he throws dust all over himself after bathing. Um, so Krishna consciousness is not a tricky process to bamboozle the Lord, right? Krishna is accepting our intentions not really, he's not really accepting the leaf, the flower, the fruit, or the water. He's accepting the devotional mood. He's accepting the intention. When Srila Prabhupada in 1969 installed the, the deities in Los Angeles, he said something really, really beautiful in his talk that I'd like to share with you. Um, <laughs> Nava, Nava Kishore says he found a letter. That's funny. Okay, so here is um, what Srila Prabhupada spoke at this deity installation in Los Angeles. He says, the real thing is bhakti. What can you offer to Krishna? Everything belongs to Krishna. What have you got? What is your value? And what is the value of your things? It is nothing. Therefore, the real thing is bhakti. The real thing is your feeling. Krishna, kindly take it. I have no qualification. 
I am most rotten, fallen, but I have brought this thing for you. Please take it. And at that point, when you hear the lecture, Prabhupada begins to cry. He, can't, he can no longer speak because of this overwhelming devotional mood. He, his voice chokes up and then he goes on and he says, this will be accepted. Don't be puffed up. Always be careful. You are dealing with Krishna. That is my request. So you see what I mean, it's all about our intention and our intention is supposed to be an impetus to our actions. We have to try to understand this and try to not misunderstand it. You know what I mean? Like, for example, the head pujari might ask me, why didn't you show up to dress the deities when you were scheduled? And I might say, well, I intended to, but I got really late, right? So that's an example of what's called the road to hell is, is paved with good intentions. My so-called good intentions shouldn't be an excuse that inconveniences Krishna and his devotees. I want to share another story with you. When we had our business, I was trying to hire some devotees. And sometimes that worked out well, and sometimes it didn't. And once we had one devotee lady who didn't show up when she was scheduled to be there. And when I asked her later why she didn't make it to work, she told me that, you know, well, you should have known it was my Guru Maharaja's appearance day, and I had to be there to make his garland. So you see what I mean? <laughs> With the right intention, she could have arranged for someone else to sub for her at work that day, or at least let someone know that she couldn't make it, right? So I wanted to share with you something from Nectar of Devotion. There's an incident quoted in the chapter called Further Features of Ecstatic Love for Krishna. Krishna is addressing his friend. So let me read you this little paragraph. Um, no, it's Krishna was once addressed by his friend. My dear Mukunda or Krishna, due to being separated from you, the cowherd boys are standing just like neglected deities in the house of a professional brahmana. Then Prabhupada explains, there is a class of professional brahmanas who take to deity worship as a means of earning their livelihood. Brahmanas in this class are not very interested in the deity. They are interested mainly in the money they can earn as holy men. So the deities worshipped by such professional brahmanas are not properly decorated. Their dress is not changed and their bodies are not cleaned. They look dirty and are not very attractive. Actually, deity worship should be done very carefully. The dress should be changed daily and as far as possible there should be ornaments. Everything should be so clean that the deity is attractive to all vis visitors. Here the example is given of the deities in the house of a professional brahmana because such deities are not at all attractive. The friends of Krishna in the absence of Krishna were appearing like such neglected deities. So I wanna say in this connection, I, I, really, I really believe that this is the idea that deities need, should be dressed every day. Um, I, I believe this is referring to deities in, in the temple. Um, I certainly can't dress my deities every day. I know some people who have deities at home do dress them every day. Maybe that's um, you know, a major part of their lifestyle. I'm not able to do that. Um, many devotees who have deities at home dress them on ekadasi days, um, every 11 days. But yeah, so I just wanted to share that sweet story with you. And um, on the topic of cleanliness and offering to Krishna in pure devotion, I was also thinking of a, a story in the Chaitanya Charitamrita about Raghava Pandit. So let me share this because this is on topic also. So Lord Chaitanya says to Raghava Pandit, I am obliged to you due to your pure love for me. And then Lord Chaitanya began to talk to all the devotees about Raghava Pandit and his worship of his deities. So Lord Chaitanya said, 
just hear about the pure devotional service rendered to Krishna by Raghava Pandit. Indeed, Raghava Pandit's service is supremely pure and highly accomplished. Apart from other commodities, just hear about his coconut offering. A coconut is sold at the rate of five gandhas each. Although he already has hundreds of trees and millions of fruits, he is still very eager to hear about the place where sweet coconut is available. He collects coconut with great endeavor from a place 20 miles away, and he gives four panas each for them. Every day, five to seven coconuts are clipped and put into water to keep cool. cool. At the time of offering boga, the coconuts are again clipped and cleansed. After holes are made in them, they are offered to Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna used to drink the juice from these coconuts, and sometimes the coconuts were left drained of juice. At other times, the coconuts were filled with juice. When Raghava Pandit saw that the juice had been drunk from the coconuts, he was very pleased. He would then break the coconut, take out the pulp, and put it on another plate. After offering the pulp, he would meditate outside the temple door. In the meantime, Lord Krishna, having eaten the pulp, would leave the plate empty. Sometimes after eating the pulp, Krishna would fill the plate again with new pulp. In this way, Raghava Pandit's faith increases, and he floats in an ocean of love. One day it so happened that about 10 coconuts were properly clipped and brought by a servant to offer to the deity. When the coconuts were brought, there was little time to offer them because it was already late. The servant holding the container of coconuts remained standing at the door. Raghava Pandit then saw that the servant touched the ceiling above the door and then touched the coconuts with the same hand. Raghava Pandit then said, people are always coming and going through that door. The dust from their feet blows up and touches the ceiling. After touching the ceiling above the door, you have touched the coconuts. Now they are no longer fit to be offered to Krishna because they are contaminated. So in the purport here, Prabhupada says something very charming from his Guru Maharaj. He says, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur states that Raghava Pandit was not simply a crazy fellow suffering from some cleansing phobia or what we would say today, maybe obsessive compulsive disorder, right? He did not belong to the mundane world in lower consciousness, accepting something to be spiritual when it is actually material is called Bhomya Ijadi. Raghava Pandit was an eternal servant of Krishna and everything he saw was related to the service of the Lord. He was always absorbed in the transcendental thought of how he could always serve Krishna with everything. Sometimes neophytes, devotees on the lower platform, try to imitate Raghava Pandit on the platform of material purity and impurity. Such imitation will not help anyone. So then the purport goes on, but I thought that was really a, a charming purport about as obsessive, what we would see as obsessive cleanliness and, and the importance of purity and deity worship, right? Um, so yeah, so in conclusion, um, we have, if we want to approach the supreme pure, we have to also do our part to come to some internal and external purity. External in so many ways, you can read Nectar of Devotion, and internal um, by trying for that constant remembrance, as the Christians say, incessant prayer. So I wanted to share something with you from a book that I read when I was 12 years old that was my first experience of mantra chanting. It's a book called The Way of a Pilgrim about a Russian peasant who walked all through Russia chanting the Jesus prayer until it became synchronized with his heartbeat. So I was so inspired by this. And I was at school and during recess, I would swing on the swings and chant, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. That was my first mantra that I ever chanted. So from that book, there's a, what, there's a very beautiful um, few lines that I want to share with you. He says, ceaseless, Interior prayer is a continuous aspiration and a yearning of the spirit of man toward God. To succeed in this sweet exercise 
it is necessary to ask God frequently that he teach you to pray constantly. Pray often and fervently, and prayer itself will reveal this mystery to you, how it is possible for it to be continuous, but it takes time. So thank you so much. And I have to also mention here that um, if you'd like to partner with me, if I don't mention this, um, my son Goravani and my dear friend Robert will really um, get on my case. So I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed to mention this, but if you'd like to partner with me and support our work on Patreon, please go to patreon.com slash Rukmini Walker. So now I am off the hook from Robert and Goravani. And thank you so very much. Um, what was important for you here? Um, please reflect something that was important for you. What's a takeaway for you? Or maybe there are some questions. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna with me. Yes. Yes, I just made my volume. I just saw in the chat that it was hard to hear me. So I just made my volume a little louder. Is this better? I think I've been able to hear you. We've had stereo effect going, but I, I just want to be sure you could hear me because we have a couple pieces of equipment going. Yes. So I, I just, I guess my reflection, I was so, um, I was really captured. I, I knew it, but I was just captured by the way you presented this idea that we, we really have nothing to give, nothing at all to give except our love and devotion. That, that really in that mood of approaching, when I think of making an offering to my deities every morning, or I think about dressing them or doing something nice for them, or just, just even in my prayers to, to Krishna, that ultimately that's, that's what surrender is, right? It's offering myself. It's just remembering to offer myself and doing it in that spirit of love because that's all that counts. All yeah. the rest of it is, I, I don't want to call it window dressing, but in a way it, it, it is because it doesn't, it's not mine to give anyway. It's just, it's just um, the only thing that's mine to give is me. And how do I do it in that spirit of deep love? So thank you for the way you presented that. It just landed today. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's really the essential point. That is the essence. And um, I mean, what, what do we have? What is mine actually? This body's not mine. Nothing is mine. Everything will be taken away sooner or later. And all I have is my own freedom to lean into Krishna, to beg Krishna to accept me. All I have is my own free will to offer to Krishna. Uh, for so long, we've been leaning out, leaning away. You know, when we face the sun, we, we, we are bright and shining. And when we turn our backs on the sun, we see um, the, a dark shadow. So we have our choice always. Do, do I want to live in the shadow or do I want to live in the sunshine of Krishna's love? And that's our free will. And, you know, I have one friend in Washington. He works for an NGO. He's, his father's a life member of this kind. And he's sort of a rebel. And he says, he told me once, his favorite verse in Bhagavad Gita is the verse where Krishna says, I've told you everything. Now you can do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Someone else have some reflections? What was important for you here? What's a takeaway for you? What are you going to share with someone else today? Hi, Bo, with me, Davy. Hi, Bo, Padma. Oh, it's so nice to hear your class. But I was reflecting so on your um, prayer that when you were 12, um, and I thought of a prayer that my mother taught us when we were little, wow. um, at the age of five, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray to Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray to Lord my soul to take. And this was such a beautiful prayer for me all of my life. And I still say this prayer, wow. but um, I think that we should have prayers that touch our heart. Yeah. 
yeah. and um, stay with us forever and that we can maybe pass on to someone else. Um, I thank you so much for your class today, but I just wanted to, that reflection came back to me. Thank you. Um, That's so beautiful. That prayer wasn't scary for you? If no. I died? Wow. No, so not. I think you were a faithful person from the very, very beginning. Hi, Krishna. Hi, Krishna. Oh, I, no. was, I was with Padma in the Pujari room at our Potomac temple the other day. And um, I, or somewhere, maybe it was outside. And I asked her, what was your first attraction to Krishna conscious, consciousness deity worship? Because she's so involved. She drives such a long distance all the way from Colombia to come dress the deities in Potomac three times a week. So I asked her if that was her first attraction. And she said, no, actually, it was Bhagavad Gita. She was first attracted to Bhagavad Gita. Isn't that amazing? So beautiful. And now she's so involved and so inspired in deity worship. So I think that's an important key. We have to find what I personally am inspired to do in service to Krishna. What, what moves my heart? Because it will be different for everyone. And that's very, very important. We're not all just like little... Uh, robots or automatons that we just you know all are the same and that's very sacred our individuality is so sacred thank you so much my dear friend thank you hi krishna hi krishna rukmini this is robert may i ask a question yes robert uh you had mentioned earlier about the the uh, devotees in california who are kind of following the, the, uh, the principles, and then also the iron in and out of the fire. Uh, very, somewhat, I would say, specific ways to approach Krishna or, or follow the principles of, uh, of Bhakti Yoga. Uh, I, I was a, a Catholic for many, many years, and I'm still attracted to some of the prayers and some of the, the processes. Uh, however, in some instances, for example, before I, I, uh, I eat prasad, I don't say the, the prayer that uh, that no, normally I said. I I do it a little differently. I I, I have uh, three Maha mantras and then I say a Catholic prayer and then I I speak some some words, my intentions, and even with other uh, other things that I do where there's a very specific process that everyone follows. I kind of do it a little differently. Uh, you know, I'm, my intentions are are, are the same. Uh, so my question is is Doing it in this way, is, it, is this uh, not following the, the processes? Is it less than uh, doing it exactly uh, like, I should, you know, like I should be doing or that others do in this instance? Thank you. That's a beautiful question. You're making it personal and you're making it your own. So that's, that's the way. That's the way. In addition to that, I think it's good to be aware. Like It's good to read Nectar of Devotion and see some of those rules are a little bit inscrutable, you know, but it's good to be aware of what the rules are. So in the process of making it your own, you're not stepping on anybody's toes. But I think that's the path for each of us. We have to make it our own and, and um, make it personal and go to the essence, which is that offering of the heart. Because if we keep dwelling in the externals, if we keep staying on the outside like what does Prabhupada use the example of licking the outside of a bottle of honey, right? How you can't taste what's inside. So that's that's kind of a compared to neophyte devotion or prakrita bhakta, when someone is just like going through the motions, doing it externally, okay, three times around, four times around, whatever, and then okay, now I'm out of here. No, that's that's uh, for the neophytes. But to go deeper, to go with the intention and to really offer your heart um, is, is, much more, is, is much more profound. Yeah. There's, you know, you reminded me, there's another beautiful Christian prayer that I really, really love that I, I learned from a friend when I was in the, visiting the Czech Republic. I'd like to share this one with you because I find it really ecstatic. So here, here, here you go. It says, oh God, who gives us unbelievable adventures. Please fill our hearts with tenderness, with the tenderness of your love, so that we love you in everything and above everything, and in this way attain the fulfillment of your promises, which surpass all of our desires. Isn't that beautiful? 
your promises surpass all of our desires. And the, the idea of serving God as, an, as a life's adventure. I love that. So Robert, you're a very adventurous guy. So yeah, let's stay on the adventure and not make it prosaic. Let's not make it boring, mundane, and just robotic, right? We have to see that this life in Krishna consciousness is a true adventure of the soul and pursue it in that conscious, intentional way. Thank you so much. Beautiful question. Hi, Bo, Rukmini Devi. This is Rajalila. And Hi, Bo, and Ekavir. Hari, Bo. Hari, Hari. I do have a question. Thank you However, for caring the love. <laughs> I see Nandini Kishiri has had her hand up for a little bit. So I'm going to let you. You probably can't see her hand. However, I do see it here. So I'll let you her ask her question first. Oh, I just had a comment. What a beautiful class. And something that I'll remember is the fire and uh, fire and uh, the, the iron rod analogy, although I have heard it so many times, this one will really stick out and how one can ignite others. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Thank you. Nice. Yeah, actually once Prabhupada, one of the biggest preachers in the ISKCON movement was Rameshwar Prabhu. He was a sannyasi and a guru at one time. And he was all about preach, preach, preach. And Prabhupada told him once, he said, the highest realization is to save oneself. So first, if we want to preach, 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 if we want to ignite others, first of all, we have to ignite ourselves. So that's really, really important. Thank you so much for your beautiful love. Yes. And what the world needs now is love, sweet love. So, Kajalila. I have so much appreciating, <laughs> appreciating this, um, this, this point, this concept of um, polishing the heart polishing the heart and coming to the mode of goodness. That brought me to this question um, when you spoke of intention, I'm guessing it's following up a little bit with Robert's question, how um, when we are uh, aligned with our intention, we want to be aligned with our intention. However, sometimes our intentions might get misunderstood. So how do we, as you mentioned, it's, an, it's internal and external. How do we internally uh, not beat ourselves up with guilt if our intentions are misunderstood? Hmm. Great question. Thank you so much. So if I'm feeling some internal guilt or shame that maybe my intentions were misunderstood, then if that's a dear person that you can talk to, that you're in Sangha with, you know, you can always go to that person. I think this is a very humble thing to do and say, you know, I don't know if my intentions were misunderstood, but I just wanted to clarify. I didn't say it very well, but what I really meant to say is that, you know, and then fill in the blank, you know, I think that that's a good thing to do because, you know, I think we underestimate the power of um, an apology really, you know, and in that sense, it's not even, it's more a clarification, but, the polishing of the heart, right? It gives us clarity. It gives us vision to see ourselves a little better. Like there's one Scottish poet, Robert Burns. He said something in Scottish, old Scottish language. It was something about asking God to give us the gift, give the gift he gives us, the gift he gives us to see ourselves as others see us. So, wow, what clarity that would be. If I could, you know, if each one of my blunders and each one of the things I say that might hurt someone's feelings, if I could see it clearly, you know, so I think there's tremendous um, power in, you know, people think, devotees sometimes think, oh, if I'm humble at work, everyone's just going to trample on me. I can't do that at work. Actually, it's a, it's a very, very powerful key to human relationships and the power of an apology. I have a story about that I can share, but I don't want to be too long. Let's see if there are other questions. Power of an apology, just a power of clarification. You know, I don't know if you really, if I was really clear what I meant when I said that, but what I really meant to say was, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, someone might say, oh, I completely understand. Or, oh, thanks for clarifying that. Or any number of fill in the blanks, whatever, you know. Can you share the story of Mini Prabhu, please? Should I share the story? Okay, let's see, if, let's see if there are other questions first before I share that story. 
Okay, Rukmini Prabhu, can I, can I say something? Please, I would be yeah. so honored. Oh my goodness. Um, so I really appreciated this class actually. You know, you always throw up some, something in me whenever I speak, you know, it's like uh, you bring up a lot for me. Um, okay. uh, I appreciated this um, notion of offering our intentions to Krishna because we have really nothing to offer him but that. So that meditation is very nice um, to walk away with. But one thing that scared me was <laughs> that if you don't have Bob, then you are really doing idol worship. Wow. That scared me because I have no Bob, you know, and I do a lot of daily worship. So what am I doing? I know Gopinath is there. Hopefully he's not, you know, he hasn't left <laughs> because I don't have Bob. So that I find so um, scary. Yeah, it's scary. I was very scared when I heard that from Srila Prabhupada also. And uh, sometimes it's good to put a little fire under our tail, right? Scare us a little bit that, hey, what am I doing? So when you make those offerings to Gopinath, I mean, the fact is you're always thinking of Gopinath, even when you're at work, you're always saying, oh, Gopinath. And then the people at work start saying it too, right? Oh, Gopinath. So you've got, you've got the whole crew of nurses saying, oh, Gopinath. So not only are you remembering him with your intention, all the other nurses are remembering him too. How, how profound is that? But um, yeah, so, I mean, when I make offerings to, I have some deities at home that I, you know, I hope they're not like deities in the home of a professional Brahmin. I don't dress them very much and I try to do what I can. But whenever I do bring a little um, fruit and nuts or some offering to put on the altar, I try to repeat and what I remember of those words of Srila Prabhupada um, to, the, to Prabhupada and to Gornitai and Radha and Krishna, that what, what is my value? What's the value of my things? It's nothing. But, you know, I've brought this for you. Please kindly take it. So I try to, you know, intentionally repeat those words so that I can remember that mood. Because, you know, you think Krishna's getting offerings from the gopis from the people in Vrindavan, from the demigods, right? On golden plates, what, what can I offer to Krishna? Something from Trader Joe's that I doctor up a little bit and offer? Thank you. <laughs> anyone else have any questions? I will share that story if there's time, but if anyone else has questions. Uh, Saradiya Mataji, her hand is up if she has any question. Haribo, Saradiya. Hare Krishna, Rukmini Prabhu, thank you very much for another very inspiring class. Are you Saradia so, from South Africa? Yes. Okay, because we, we have one in we have one in Washington also. Oh, okay. okay. And I know so there's another one from Africa in the UK, you told me. Right? Yes, yes. <laughs> so um I, I really appreciated the, the the point that you made that the only thing we have to offer Krishna is like our, our devotion. And my, my question was that in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna does say that, you know, whatever we do, we can just do as an offering for him. But uh, my understanding is that is not like the highest level of practice. So when we are living at home and we cook and we offer prasadam, I have to be honest, like sometimes, especially if I cook lunch, then I'm thinking about, you know, trying to make it as nice as possible for Krishna and also for my family, but I do, like, I do spend some time, and I really make effort, and, you know, that, that is, that is, I feel better, but when it comes to, for instance, making breakfast, I do offer my breakfast, but I just offer Krishna what I have to eat, so my meditation is like, okay, I need to eat something, because I just need to kind of get my body and soul together, so now I'll offer that to Krishna, so my question is, how can we in that situation where we don't necessarily have you know the time because i'd love to make a whole elaborate offering you know every morning and afternoon at night but i mean it's not it's not like um, feasible for me at this point in my life so how do we improve the offering when we know we're actually just offering what we need to take and we're not really you know making something for krishna 
to offer. You know, Krishna also wants you to maintain your body and maintain your family and do what needs to be done. And he is, most of all, he's most merciful. So he's not a rules and regulations type of a guy. He's an intentional type of a, a Lord, you know. And um, I think the verses you're referring to. So I, I just opened my Bhagavad Gita to the ninth chapter. So chapter 9, verse 26 says, if one offers me with love and devotion, a leaf, a flower, a fruit, or water, I will accept it. So that is essential bhakti. That is the essence of bhakti. There's a verse that follows that one that says, I think you're referring to this one. Whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer or give away, and whatever austerities you perform, do that, O son of Kunti, as an offering to me. And then Prabhupada says the first line in his purport, it is the duty of everyone to mold his life in such a way that he will not forget Krishna in any circumstance. You know, everyone has to work for the maintenance of his body and soul together, and Krishna re herein recommends that you work for him. So what, I, what also came up for me when you asked that question is, did you ever, you must have read that story. I don't know if everyone on this call has read the story in Nectar of Devotion of the poor Brahmin who he had no money, he had no facilities to offer anything to Krishna nicely. He was so poor, but he was sitting in a Bhagavatam class one day and he heard that Krishna accepts an offering if you just do it in your mind. And he was so inspired by that. This was his personal inspiration, right? So then he started doing it. He started making a whole mental worship. Saradiya Rasa, you know the story, right? Yes, I do remember the story. I okay, love so that he, story. Yeah, it's a beautiful, it's a very important story. So he started making all of these nice preparations all in his mind when he sat in his rags on the riverbank, whatever. And then, so he thought he would make sweet, sweet rice for Krishna. And sweet rice is best taken when it's cold, as cold as possible. So he just touched the top to see if it was cool enough to offer to Krishna and he burnt his finger. And what happened was, as the story goes, Krishna was sitting in Vaikuntha with Rukmini Devi, and he started laughing when he saw that, that this Brahmin is so intentional. He just burnt his finger on his mental offering, and he was laughing. And then Rukmini Devi said, Krishna, why are you laughing? Something's funny. And then Krishna said, you'll see. And then Krishna went down flying on Garuda, and he brought that Brahmin. The picture's a nectar of devotion. It's so charming. He brought that Brahman right up to Vaikuntha to be with him because of that mental offering. So, you know, when you offer your, um, whatever you're offering that, you know, that the best that you can, you know, you can think, you can say that to Krishna. I wish this was, um, you know, 108 offerings of, of Chapan Bog with all the beautiful preparations, but it's not, it's only what I'm going to be taking to work. So please forgive me and please accept my intentions. And please, um, please bless um, myself and my family that with your prashadam, that this um, prashadam may give us strength in our lives and purify our hearts. I think that's very intentional. Krishna understands, right? Rukmini, can I uh, add to, to that story a little bit? I, I think you'll like this. I'm, sure. I'm reading uh, Miracle on Second Avenue uh, that uh, a very dear friend gave to me for my birthday. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rukmini. <laughs> I was just reading it the other day, and it's so perfect for, for this conversation. Uh, when when Prabhupada was just started the, the mission, he is he was in uh, in this in the um, uh, priceless priceless matchless priceless gifts, matchless. matchless gifts, and there was a he was giving a talk, and there was maybe twenty or thirty uh, young devotees there, and he was talking about service. Uh, and while he was talking about service, this drunk came wandering in to the to the temple he was disheveled and he was big smile and he was obviously uh, obviously uh, drunk and everyone was very tense as he walked up toward Prabhupada because every, everyone was thinking oh no this could be bad out of his pocket he pulls out a, a roll of toilet paper that was still in its wrapping and he just <laughs> and he just uh, <laughs> he put it in front of Prabhupada and then went to the middle of the room and sat down, you know, and with, his, with his legs crossed, and and Prabhupada, he smiled and he said, he 
said to everyone, instead of, look at this, this man, he's, even though he's not put together, he still provides service. This is service. <laughs> you know, a roll of toilet paper. And then, then a couple of days later, the guy came back, uh, you know, in terms of how these simple things can, can progress. Is that, and a couple of days later, he came back, he wasn't drunk, and he was cleaned up, and uh, he, he looked presentable. So I, it was such a, a touching example of uh, simple service and, and how, you know, how, how we could do it. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. What a great story. Thank you so much. That's a really beautiful book, Miracle on Second Avenue, if any of you haven't read it yet by Mukunda Maharaj, one of the first devotees. His name is on the incorporation papers of the first incorporation, Michael Grant. Yeah. yeah. What else? Thank you, Robert. That was really great. Anybody else? I hope there are a few hands. Nawak Kishore Prabhu, Madhvacharya Prabhu. Yes. Please ask. Madhvacharya is here? Oh my gosh. Now I'm embarrassed and starstruck. I thought he was at work. Krishna, Krishna. Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. Hare Krishna, my most humble obeisances to you. Thank you for enlivening us, enlivening us with your words of wisdom and inspiration. I, you know, I just wanted to say something about, you said something about living with prayer and the importance of prayer, you were speaking about that. And uh, I was thinking how beautiful that is, that, you know, when you try to live with prayer, prayer lives with you. Mm. That, you know, prayer comes to you in times when there are difficulties and challenges. That when you, you know, have that intention of trying to be prayerful and humble and, and pray like this, then prayer lives with you also. And, and prayer... Mm, gives you shelter when you have need for shelter. And that's, you know, that's really beautiful. And um, I also wanted to mention that about my wife Kunti, because you were talking, we, we were talking about, you know, this, this wonderful meditation about, you know, of course we have nothing to offer to Krishna other than our hearts, other than, you know, our, our, um, our intent to serve. And how, and that's how we approach our deity service. But, but I I noticed with Kunti that the way she approaches deity service, it's like because I, I can remember many times when I was cooking late for for the deities, and she would chastise me. She would say, "Why are you making Krishna wait all day to eat? You know, <laughs> he's here. It's six. It's seven, and he hasn't eaten all day. What, you know, as if, you know, I mean, it's like even." you know, beyond the meditation, if I have nothing to offer, it's like, if I don't feed him on time, why he'll be hungry, he'll be inconvenienced, you know, <laughs> and how that meditation is, you know, really powerful. And she she displays that. And uh, I just wanted to mention that. Beautiful. And this is this is radical personalism, right? This is what we call radical <laughs> personalism, we, we all want, I mean, at least I want to become radical. And when we put those two together, radical personalism, this is in the mood of Mother Yasoda, right? If I don't feed him, he'll die. If I don't chastise him, he could grow up to become a criminal. You know, I have to straighten him out now while he's young or it'll be too late, right? So thank you. Yeah, and this idea of incessant prayer is very inspiring to me. We can, you know, we have so many resources through technology we have, I have that little machine, I keep it, I carry it around with me, I have it in the bathroom, and then I sometimes bring it in the kitchen, it has all of Prabhupada's lectures, or, you know, we have YouTube, we have so many, we can listen to so many great sadhus, so, um, and we can always be chanting when we're driving, we can be listening to Kirtan, we can always be calling out to Krishna in his holy name, and always be connected, like a little light bulb that's screwed in to the powerhouse, right, otherwise we can so easily make offenses and forget and make blunders like we see in this Daksha Yajna. What a mess, right? So our lives can be a mess like that too if we don't plug in. So thank you so much. Um, and I think of you, you know, actually, you know, I pray for you and Kunti every day. And I pray for, I pray for um, the caregivers and I pray for all 
you know, people who are suffering. But, you know, when I think of you in your work in the hospital, there you are putting someone under anesthesia, right? And I know you're praying for that person. You know, that person may be, who knows who, he may have been coming with a gunshot wound or something else. And I know that you're very intentional in your work and how you're blessing the world by praying for each one of those persons who crosses your path. This is powerful. We shouldn't think it's not effective because it's highly effective. The intentions of pure devotees like you are very, very powerful in this world. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Anybody else have any thoughts? Oh, Navaki Shore. I heard that Navaki Shore has something. Very thoughtful person. Hare Krishna, Navaki Rukmini. Hare Bol. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you for the class. It's, uh, it's wonderful to hear from you, and especially uh, when you mentioned Shrimad Bhagavatam, how Shukadeva Goswami um, and these great saints that when they talk about Bhagavatam, it, it uh, helps to relish it more. And I appreciate um, your uh, delving into this verse, and, and, and it made me think about a lot of things and how I can um, incorporate Krishna more into my life. And uh, I was thinking about some things that came to mind, and um, you gave the example of a, of a rod going in and out of the fire, and how um, and we have these different purificatory processes in Krishna consciousness. And uh, sometimes, um, I don't know if everybody's heard this, but sometimes when we describe a situation that's painful, we say, oh, that, that was very purifying, and it's almost like a euphemism, euphemism to to talk about uh, a situation and um, that when we come into Christian consciousness, we bring in certain, um, like Chitra Maharaj talks about how we bring in certain um, things into the community and even into any relationship, we bring that in and by that interaction, uh, sometimes certain things get aroused or, or come up. So if, if you know, if we're very uh, punctual person, if we're around somebody who's not punctual, then you know, there's some conflict and that, you know, that might help us work on something else, you know, that we need to work on. Um, and so I guess I was meditating on two different things. I'm trying to combine two different questions. I know that you've been doing, oops, I'm sorry. I know that you've been doing uh, work in, in the diversity group. And uh, last year around this time, I had no idea what Juneteenth was. And uh, today is. is I'm sorry, that you had holiday. no idea what 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 was. Uh, Juneteenth, um, uh, that today uh, being the historical day that uh, slaves were, were freed and that and now it's a federal holiday. Right. And, is it today? Um, is it actually today? Is it today? I think so. Yeah. Wow! Yeah. Wow! We should have mentioned that. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Sure. And and there's this. Um, Sometimes like, I, I, I was just glancing at it, but sometimes it's controversial. It can be, uh, I'm not, I haven't looked at the corporate in a while, but this verse about Kirat or Hununda, Hununda Bokasha, about how different races can come to Christian consciousness. Um, and, but the, the emphasis of that, of that verse is how Christian consciousness is all purifying. And I, I guess thinking about that in my own life, that um, I think, there was a certain point in my life when I had to figure out what was working for me in Christian consciousness and what wasn't. I think every individual has, to, has that. And for someone like yourself, who's been associated with this con for over 50 years, um, who's been dedicated to the movement, what are your personal thoughts about how the movement, um, how, you know, about bringing in what, you know, our personal values and how the movement is meant to purify that and, and how that process works. Um, you know, we can talk about theoretically, but you've seen it from a societal viewpoint. And I'm curious to get your thoughts um, on that and, and the different devotees that you counsel and you've, you've grew, grown up with and who you've been around. Thank you. Very deep question, as, as always from you. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, that, that verse that you mentioned, Kirata Hunandra Polinda Pulkasa Abira Sumba Yavana Kishadayaha. Janeshu Papa Yadupa Shraya Shraya Sudanti Tasmai Prabhavishnave Namaha. 
So what the verse says, this is a verse that Prabhupada would always so often quote, it's in his letters, it's in his purports. And, and this verse says that everyone has access. That's what this verse says. I wouldn't call it controversial because what the verse says is, this is the verse that he would quote when people would say, you know, you're bringing down the whole system. You're trying to make leches and yavanas into, into brahmanas. You're, you're destroying the whole caste system. And when people would be condemning him, how, how dare you, you know? This is the verse he would quote. So maybe it was controversial for them. To me, it's a great highlight of Prabhupada's vision and Bhakti Siddhanta's vision, you know? I mean, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, when he brought his followers to Vrindavan, you know, people who he'd given Brahmin initiation to who were from, not from Brahmin families. Most of the temples slammed the doors in his face and people threw rocks at them. They tried to kill him actually. One of those times they tried to kill Bhakti Siddhanta. He had to escape the situation by switching clothes with one of his Grihastha disciples. They, he put on the white dress and um, had to get, get out through a back door and, and the disciple put on his, he was also tall. He put on the sannyas robes of his guru. So this is the, this is the great courageous mission of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Srila Prabhupada, um, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. It's for everyone, you know? Anyone who's taken birth in, as a human being, Lord Chaitanya was also uplifting the animals. We're not so qualified as, as that, but um, you know, it's interesting in that verse, it mentions the people from Hungary, the people from Russia, I think the people from China, it even mentions people from Andhra, which you think, oh, Andhra Pradesh, very Brahminical place. But it, it mentions the fallen people of Andhra, right? So frankly, we're all fallen, right? We're all fallen in, in this age. We're all unqualified. And the only qualification is the mercy of, of uh, Lord Chaitanya, the mercy of our Guru Maharaj. You know? So, um, and I think if we're going to carry this mission forward to the future, we have to understand that in a non-sectarian way. Because, um, you know, this is not just Vedic culture. This is uh, bhakti culture, which, which transcends um, so many material, uh, so-called Vedic uh, uh, rituals. So we have to understand that. And, we, and if we want an example of how to live that, then we have to look at you know, people who, who, who live it properly. Look at Srila Prabhupada. I love the story of Srila Prabhupada. Okay, so here's a great saint who's just come from Vrindavan, right? Great scholar, great saint. And here he is living on the Lower East Side of New York, like two blocks from the Bowery where, where you know, drunks are lying passed out on the, on the street. You know? And here he is. And he told the young boys who were coming to follow him to respect the landlord just like he's your father. The landlord liked Prabhupada because he was so humble and such a gentleman, but he didn't like Prabhupada's followers. So Prabhupada's telling them, treat him like he's your own father. And Prabhupada, this is written in the Lilamrita, Prabhupada was taking, helping the landlord to take the other tenant's garbage out to the street. Can you imagine? And I always think, what must have been in that garbage, right? hypodermic needles, drugs, meat, liquor, craziness, right? And Prabhupada was helping the landlord empty the garbage out of his beautiful humility. So, you know, we think we're so great that we can't touch anything unclean because I'm, you know, I'm so caste conscious now. No, this is not the mood of Lord Chaitanya. This is not the mood of Srila Prabhupada. So uh, the mood is mercy, humility. That's what we have to learn. And when, when we see things that don't ring true to that uh, epitome of, of example, then we have to know that this is, this is someone who hasn't understood the essence. And we can, you know, fold our hands, bow our heads, say, Haribola. But for your intimate association, look for those who, who really do get the essence. Hey, Bolduk Mini Prabhu, I just wanted to share a pastime that I share sometimes. I, I love to share this pastime, the story of two great saintly personalities. And in that mood of reflecting on this mood of radical personalism as being coined by Ram Baru and Sudharma, yourself, and so many of the wonderful devotees. Um, I'm going to make this pastime very brief. However, there's a real saint. Her name is Rukmini Devi.
And there's a real saintly person that came to Krishna consciousness many, many years ago and experienced racism in the temple and, and actually expressed that and was ready to leave the temple. However, there was this one saintly person, speaking of radical personalism, radical personalism, one saintly person that somehow got the attention of this person, the saintly person that was ready to leave Krishna consciousness due to experiencing racism. And that person was able to, as Rupmini shared in this class today, polish the heart of that saintly person. And today that saintly person is the person that we all revere so much, His Holiness Bhakti Tirta Maharaj. And we thank Rukmini Devi for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prajalila. Well, I have to honestly say that I wasn't the only one. And Jay Jayadwaita Swami was also reaching out to him um, very affectionately. So thank you. Thank you for that. It's a, it's a precious memory. And I don't know if it's true, but at least um, I can thank you for it. <laughs> well, that, he shared that with us. So <laughs> he was very kind. He was beyond kind. He was beyond radical personalism. He was beyond the beyond. So thank you so much. Thank with you me, Maji, for sharing his mood. With me, Maji, I really like that story that Rajabriva Maji added because sometimes I feel like we, we emphasize so much that the process for everyone, the devotional service for everyone, Krishna consciousness is the solution. Just do this and, and you'll be fine. And I think that, I think for me, it, it's been really important to, to make sure that we're trying to access everyone in, in whatever way that will help them to, to benefit, you know, from our community. And I, I think that example, is, you know, shows, like being reminded of that example showed me that what you did to, to do, to especially reach out to Bhakti Chaitanya Maharaj to help him, you know, overcome that obstacle. And I think that, um, you know, whether we're coming with Krishna conscious with whatever, you know, conditioning, that the example of devotees just trying to be really personal and help us to grow from where we are is what makes us successful. Thank you. That's beautiful. You know, sometimes we think it was the prashadam or it was the Bhagavad Gita or it was the deities or it was, you know, really Krishna consciousness is passed from person to person, from heart to heart. And, and somebody cared enough to reach out to you. Somebody somewhere cared enough to take that time and that inspiration. And I always say, you know, I know Sara Diarasa is on this call. I think she was on the call I did for South Africa the other day. And, you know, I think, I think it's heartbreaking when I see at our temples that we're all in our little cliques talking to our own friends at the, <laughs> at the Sunday program and, you know, and somebody sitting by themselves. And so we have to reach out to that person that's sitting by themselves. The most heartbreaking thing is when someone says, oh, yeah, I came to the temple once six years ago, but nobody talked to me. So I haven't come back in six years. That's the most heartbreaking thing because it's up to us. It's past person to person. It's, you know, it's all of those things. It's the Gita, it's the Prashadam, it's the deities, it's the Kirtan, it's everything. But most of all, it's being passed heart to heart by someone who cares. And, you know, another story that's, ha that's ha happened more recently, there's a beautiful devotee in New Jersey. Um, Anutama Prabhu just made him, he's now the, um, national director for, of communications. His name is Madan Gopal. Um, Indian devotee, he's from an Indian family, but his parents weren't devotees at all. As a matter of fact, they were opposed. And he came to the temple and one beautiful god sister of mine, Begavati, I don't know if you know her, she's in the Lachua community. She took the time and trouble and care to reach out to him. And she, she became like a mother to him. And now he's, he's one of the big leaders of ISKCON. I mean, honestly, he's doing tremendous service. He's absolutely brilliant. And it was because she took her time and care to care. She gave her love, you know, this is what the world needs now. Love, sweet love. Yeah. So the root meaning. Uh, I heard <laughs> Thank you so much again. Just like all the other devotees, we are pr truly appreciate all that you give and, and uh, you're spending this time with us. I, I, you made me think about a, a um, term that Bhakti Chitra Maharaj, uh, the definition he gave for preaching. And he said that uh, preaching is actually removing the obstacles that keep one, one from accepting Krishna. Wow, so beautiful. 
so and that manifests, <laughs> yes, and, and manifests in so many different ways. Uh, it's not just speaking. It's uh, uh, doing the things that you just express, being that person that extends the radical personalism that you also express to That's remove the obstacle that, um, you know, that you know, keeps one from accepting Krishna. And that's something, the way that you actually live and we all think of you and we really appreciate you so much in, in our lives. Thank you so much. Well, you know, we talk so much about preach, preach, preach. There's one lecture I heard by Prabhupada. He said, we are hearing so much preach, 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 that they do not know. They must be empowered to preach. Whoa, you know? So I think first comes because our process is shravanam kirtanam, right? It starts with hearing, but we want to start with, I'm going to preach. I'm going to ram it down their throats, right? No, first we have to hear. We have to find out where's this person coming from? What are their needs, interests, and concerns? What, you know, what's in their heart? What brought them to the temple? What brought them to the place where they are today? We have to hear, you know? There's, we always hear, right? Two ears, we have one mouth. But did, have you heard this one? This one's really nice. That the, in the word heart is the word ear. There's an H at the beginning and there's a T at the end. And in the middle of that word heart is the word ear. Wow. So we have to hear. If we want to um, touch people's hearts, we have to hear from them before we start, you know, pontificating. Right? Because we're so expert, I think we devotees of this kind can live in our heads, right? Can live so much in our heads. We've got this, we've got this, I've got this, you know, I read this, I read this, I read this, but, but what about going down to the heart space and actually experiencing that empathy for, for people where, where they are today, meet them where they are. This is actual, um, removing the obstacles, as Bhakti Chitta Swami said, right? Like path smoothing. I love the term path smoothing. We had, a, we had one manager of one of our stores. Her name was Pat, P-A-T, but she always talked about her, that her job was just path smoothing. So it was like, Pat, path smoothing. So that's, that's what you said. That's what Bhakti Tirtha Swami said, removing the obstacles, clearing the dust out of the path. Okay, on my path, there's so many brambles, there's so many obstacles. And and this is what a real loving um, Vaishnava would do. Clear the path, smooth the path so that I can run to Krishna, right? That's, uh, that's preaching. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. I love you guys so much. My, my favorite devotees in the whole world. Thank you so much. So. You were going to I tell a story that? though. Should I tell that story? Okay. Yes. This, is, this is one of my favorites. And I didn't read it in Srimad Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita. I read it in the Washington Post Sunday Magazine. Huh. Okay, so here's the story. So there, I, I mean, I'm apologizing if you've heard this from me before, but I think it's important. I think it's important and transformative. Let me just look in the chat. There's something in the chat here. Okay. Okay, so here's the story. So there was a man, he was a music teacher and um, he was a high school music teacher. And with great trouble and expense, he arranged for his music class. I don't know where they were, but he arranged for his class, his students to come to New York to hear a concert um, conducted by a very, very important world famous conductor. So, you know, he went to a lot of trouble to do this. So when they got to New York, three of the girls in the class cut the concert and they went shopping. They didn't, they didn't come to the concert. And he was so, you know, so mad. And uh, the next day he's telling his wife how angry he was. And he's telling her, um, you know, those brats, I went to so much trouble and so much expense. And this was so important for their education. And they just, they just cut the class and go shopping, you know, I'm so mad, right? And so his wife was very wise. And she said, I think you owe them an apology. He's like, what? I owe them an apology. They should be apologizing to me. And she said, no, I think you owe them an apology. So then he had to really go into meditation and think about what, what was he going to do to apologize to these students? So the next day he called them into his office and these girls, okay, they knew what they did. 
And they're looking at each other like, are we gonna get expelled? Are we gonna flunk this class? What's he gonna do to us? Is he gonna kick us out? And they're just like, uh-oh. And so then he says to them, you know, I called you here because I really have to apologize to, to the three of you because I really failed you. And I failed you in your education because I failed to let you know how important this concert was for your musical education. So I have to really offer you my deepest apologies for the ways that I failed you. And then how heart opening is that, you know? So he could have blasted them, he could have expelled them, he could have kicked them out, he could have flunked them. But how, how transformative that apology was. So I think um, never underestimate the power of an apology. We can always do that. You know, if we feel like there's been some friction with someone else, we can we kind of come up and say, you know, um, what I said wasn't really what I what I meant, and I'm I'm so sorry if my words hurt you because you know you mean so much to me or whatever, you know. But the power of an apology is very very transformative. It works in marriages. It even works with teenagers. It works at work. It works at the temple. It just works. So, and it, it certainly works with Krishna. When you come before the Lord and say, for so many long years, I've forgotten you. But from today, I'm trying to remember you. Please accept me. That's an apology, right? That's part of our theology. So instead of being so pig-headed, right? But I know everything. No, I'm the greatest. I am the greatest. No. So, yeah, and actually, um, Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj met Muhammad Ali, right? He's the one who said, I am the greatest. He was so great at fighting, you know? But then later in his life, he got, uh, um, I think it was some, it was um, Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, yeah. And then he was saying that, that God gave me this to teach me a lesson because I was proud. And so he was, you know, he was offering his, his apology to God. I, I said I was the greatest. Actually, my Lord, you are the greatest. So that was his. He was a beautiful, God-fearing person. And he had the great fortune to meet Bhaktivedanta Swami. So yeah, the power of an apology, I think we should bring it into our... Um, lexicon into our lives, into our hearts. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Is there anything else anyone else would like to share? We are, uh, I'm, oh, sorry. Is that Kunti? Yeah, I want to pray to find that song, Love, Sweet Love, and we could just go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I said that because I knew that Manvachar used to be a disc jockey. So <laughs> I was thinking of that song, you know, right. yeah, that would be nice. That would be really nice. Warren Warwick, yeah, Burt Bacharach song. <laughs> <laughs> I know, when Madhvacharya gets together with Radna Swami, oh my goodness, those two get into it. All those old songs and, and yeah, and you know, Navakishore Prabhu, we are so enriched by our diversity. Um, there, I'll say something else. You know what's really beautiful? There's something in the Quran that actually I, I did this class the other day with the devotees in South Africa. And, and this one devotee had a question, why, why did God make us all different? You know, we could, we could just get along if we were all the same. And, and I, I told him that I heard this thing from the Quran that, that it says in the Quran that Allah, in his infinite wisdom has made us all different so that we could learn to get along with each other. Because if in his infinite wisdom he had wanted, he could have made us all the same, but he didn't. He made us all different so we would learn to get along with each other. And uh, yeah, like a vase of flowers, you know, if all the flowers are the same height and the same color and the same type and so boring, right? What a boring world that would be. So this is our challenge, uh, to be enriched by our diversity and spread that message. Diversity and inclusion is so important and so sacred. So thank you for bringing up, that up. Rukmini? Yeah. 
uh, I, I'm among friends here, so I, I think that most will appreciate this, this uh, sentiment. Anita and I have had the very uh, great fortune to be able to be in contact with Rukmini quite frequently, and we've seen many, many of her classes, and we've had the opportunity to speak with her. And one constant of the many things we love about her, and there are many, one thing that uh, in relation to our conversation, working with others and preaching, is her ability, just like Prabhupada, you know, so many examples in this book when he first came to the United States, he met, you know, young hippies who were doing drugs and who were really a very uh, uh, tumultuous uh, stage in their lives. But no matter what uh, they were, he accepted them and was able to speak with them at that at that level. And in our our friendship with Rukmini, it's been the same thing. She obviously is a very elevated soul and can and can talk about the most highly elevated subjects uh, regarding Krishna consciousness, but also she is open and forgiving and humble with people who are just starting out and never judge, never judging anyone. And I'm sure it's valuable to everyone and so appreciated. And it's something that I personally am so grateful for and always approachable. And this is the essence of, of bhakti yoga is, is that we are always welcomed and always loved by Krishna. And I think Rukmini is uh, is a perfect example and deliverer of that very loving message and uh, we're so very grateful for that service and thank you. Thank you for your very kind words. As my grandmother used to say, from your lips to God's ears, I wish that would be true. And one other thing, did you know that there was a black man who was one of the first people who signed on the incorporation papers? Carl Jurgens. He was initiated by Srila Prabhupada. His name was Karlapati, but his wife, his wife was white. She didn't like Krishna consciousness anyway. He was one of the first signers on the incorporation of ISKCON. Karlapati, Karl Jurgens. So hey, yeah, everyone is welcome. Everyone is blessed. Everyone can has access to bhakti by the grace, by the mercy of the devotees. That's what the verse says. By the mercy of the devotees of the Prabhavishnave Namaha, the power, all powerful Vishnu. That's how we get access. Hi, Krishna, Madam Green. Hi, Paul, Mitravinda. Please accept my obeisance. It's all glories to your divine, merciful, and wonderful Guru Maharaj, Srila Prabhupada. Thank you so much for giving class today. <clears throat> um, this beautiful house that Srila Prabhupada built. Um, which is for everyone based on Lord Chaitanya's mission of compassion for the living souls, the, uh, the conditioned souls, us as jivas, covers everything that breathes and it's so beautiful. <clears throat> um, and I, my question is more um, regarding empathy. So we as conditioned souls, um, well, the soul is not conditioned so much, but these bodies make us conditioned and the experiences that we have. Regarding empathy, um, how would it be best um, to move in a way that relates to the beauty of bhakti um, when there's suffering of someone instead of relating to our own experiences and, and putting that forth as, yeah, it happened to me. So, you know, there's a reflection there. How can we best move forward in a way that reflects the uh, honor of the beauty of bhakti and the compassion that, that Srila Prabhupada gave when he came to so many people that did things so differently from him, yet he was so um, loving and kind and empathetic that he gave the love without, um, you know, that kind of, well, you know, I did it this way and it's better, but, but in a way that related to so much heart felt energy that transformed them. And, and when there's empathy, then people are cushioned enough to move through the pain. Beautiful. Yeah, that's a beautiful question and it's such an important um, meditation. And I, I think it comes by deep listening, you know? I know myself, I'm not very good at, at deep listening. I talk, talk, talk. And, uh, but deep listening, I think, is the path to heart opening, to be able to hear uh, the messages we need to hear from our source, from our inner selves, 
and from others in the world, that deep listening is, is the path. And, uh, you know, we're, we're running around so fast doing so many things, but we don't take a pause to really reflect and deeply listen to others, to our own inner selves, and to what Krishna has to tell us. So I think that's, that's a good answer. You know, the um, Dalai Lama said something, here I am being my eclectic self, but the Dalai Lama said something really wise. He said, uh, when we talk, we just say things that we already know, but when we listen, we can learn something new. So I think we all have a lot to learn from, from others. Um, even if it's just like, I don't know if any of you saw the beautiful poem Ananda Vrindavan wrote, and Nita just posted about chanting like a little bird. People are appreciating, already appreciating so much. It's up on urbandavy.com. So yeah, just, uh, you know, being able to even just hear the, the chanting of a little bird, you know, and how that little bird is calling out, oh, oh, my beloved, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? There's one scholar that said that this is the most innate call of every living being. Where is my beloved? Where is my beloved? Where is my beloved? But it's not the worms we're looking for, this little birds or insects, but it's actually, where is my beloved? So let's listen more deeply. Thank you for your beautiful introspective. Um, Ma Mother Rukmini, I have to say, please, Rukmini Devi Dasi, thank you so much for that really heartfelt response. I truly appreciate it and I connect with it for myself and realize that I'm not, I'm not a very good hearer. I respond in ways that relate to my own emotions and my experiences. And you, what you did was you opened up a portal for me to see and reflect on how I can be better with it through me inquiring uh, to you, I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't come back initially. My son's going to a baseball game, but um, it it really has touched me deeply in a way that helps me to um, be able to look deeper at mm -hmm. at how I'm not hearing and when I'm not hearing, and how my responses to pain, suffering, confusion, my own anarthas, um, how I'm coding it and hearing it maybe in others and reflecting it in a way that is not representative of this beauty that is bhakti you know mm -hmm. this gift that you know Srila Prabhupada gave us here in the west mm -hmm. um through Lord Chaitanya's hand um and and it it, it was really um I don't know like when you when you spoke that way it, it really touched me internally I was really trying to stay external with it but mm -hmm. um I do, I feel the ways that I have not um, been that. Mm -hmm. I feel the ways that, you know, it's caused me to point a finger outward. Mm -hmm. And in inquiring from you, it, it really made me point back at me. Thank you so much. I appreciate that so much. Thank you for saying that. You know, you reminded me, there's a story of a devotee in the UK who um, his daughter had unfortunately passed away and um, devotees were coming to him and, and uh, he felt, you know, they were preaching to him and, and telling him, well, you know, she's not her body and, you know, she has an eternal soul. And, and he felt like so isolated that they were coming to him to fulfill their own need to preach, but they weren't really coming to him to be there for him to really... And sometimes that comes just by being present, just by being silent, you know, sometimes just being there for someone because we're so ready to, to preach and to advise and to, you know, I know I am, you know. So sometimes just being present with someone, even silently, just showing it's like a kind of solidarity for the soul, you know. I'm, I'm just here for you. I care for you. you know, you're precious to me. And sometimes it's not about preaching at all. So, so thank you for your deep introspection. It's beautiful. I appreciate it so much. Hi, Bo Rukmini Devi. This is my last um, question. <laughs> and um, I just really want to thank Mitra also for that deep introspection. That was just, um, just so kind and so generous of her for, to share that vulnerability with all of us. Thank you very, very much. Um, 
And um, Rukmini Prabhu, I guess my question is relating to you. You mentioned um, at some point, or well, you mentioned about this uh, deep listening, which we are all acknowledging that perhaps we we may not do that. Most, at least, I can say I don't always do that. And then you mentioned about generosity. Uh, I'm sorry about uh, um, being able to. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm kind of getting a little blank. It's, uh, you, oh yeah, apologies, apologies, apologies. Sorry, you spoke a lot about apologies. And so my question is about me not being a Sahaja because sometimes I think a lot of times when I think of apologies, I think externally, you know, I need to apologize to X, Y, and Z. I did this or said that or whatever. However, what, I've, what has been coming to me lately and I'm praying this is not being a Sahaja is to really apologize to myself because I, I know that Krishna is there in my heart and I know that I'm not where I could possibly be in terms of realizations about my relationship with the Lord. And so within my own self, I apologize. Brajalila, okay, you know, apologize to yourself for not being where you might want, may want to be, aspiring to be. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if I am being on a, a sahaja thinking like that. So the definition of, thank you very much for that. So the definition, what's a sahaja? A sahaja means someone who takes things cheaply, who takes Krishna's pastimes cheaply, who takes everything cheaply. So I think this is just awakened consciousness when we start to really reflect internal. I don't think it's sahaja at all. This is when we're waking up and we start to start to question ourselves and start to see and where are my real gifts and, and where are, what's, what's holding me back to be able to see this is a gift that comes from introspection, from the dictation of super soul, you know? I always like to say that Krishna sits in our hearts through so many bodies. We're traveling all around as a, an insect of this or that, a demigod. And he's un, basically unemployed if we don't uh, reach out to him and ask for his direction. So that direction of super soul is coming from that introspection from from super soul through our intelligence. So yeah, if I start to reflect, this is what's holding me back. These, these are my gifts that I should share. And these are the obstacles that I, I put for myself or, you know, these are my strengths and weaknesses. How can I serve better? How can I love you more? This is, this is just beautiful introspection. So I said, I said that too, to listen more deeply to our source, Krishna, to listen more deeply to our own selves and to listen more deeply to others in this world, the other people in our world, you know? And I, you know, when, when you started s s making that point, you know what came to my mind? You know this saying that every, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future? That's so powerful, you know? We're just like judging, okay, this person's this and that person's that. And you know, I've got everything pin pigeonholed in the whole world, all my judgments of higher and lower and wrong and right. No, you know, every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. And to be able to try to make our vision like Krishna's vision, to try to make our vision like the vision of pure devotees who see everyone serving Krishna except for me. You know, this is Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Every, this is the Uttam Adhikari level, right? Everyone is serving Krishna except for me. So how can I smooth my own path and the paths of others right beautiful thank you so much you. love your love your association thank you so much thank you hey krishna rukmini prabhu may i say yes. something loka it, it, it's so beautiful and 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 I, I i mean not to be flip i'm not being flip here but i'm thinking of of the song that you keep quoting <laughs> speaking now one came to me from godspell the musical godspell um uh in which we you know the song is um day by day lord you know i pray that i may see you more clearly love you more dearly and follow you more nearly isn't that what it is all boils down to right see you that, more clearly say it again See you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly. Love it. 
day by day, day by day. That's the, and, and so you, day by day, my prayer, that's my Lord to my Lord. It's from the, from that musical Godspell. It's such an old one. See, but, you can just see how, how these gifts, these, these beautiful inspirations from Krishna or like George Harrison, you know, I really want to love you, my Lord, but it takes so long. I know, you know yeah. all these great artistic personalities who are getting these inspirations from super soul. How beautiful. Thank you for that. I'm going to put that in my book. I love that one. Oh, wow. how sweet. <laughs> Can we hear the song? Is Madhvacharya, the, the, um, this jockey, going to put that song up for us? Is it pos even possible? Uh, the, Nava, did you do that? Did you put a link? Actually, uh, yeah, Matravinda said it was by Danny Hathaway. Can, can you play it <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry I, I i i don't have access to it right now i apologize <laughs> all right well we can remember it and find it somewhere maybe it will appear on youtube or something right thank you all for your wonderful association my favorite devotees in the world my my deepest inspiration to be with all of you thank you for inviting me so 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 much Please come back again and again and again and again, please. <laughs> we love you so much. It's true. Can please, I, please, I, please, I, again and again and again. Thank you.